Thanks, Sean. Uh, and it is it is it is a pleasure to be here today. So thank you, thank you very much. And what a great space to be in to be celebrating architecture. Uh, it's really wonderful. And so I vote for this venue for taking, <laughs> for taking a vote. Um, but before I start, I just wanted to say a little bit uh, about uh, the local chapter, which I think we're so blessed to have. Um, and I think too many of us have taken it for granted. Taken it for granted. And I think it's something that that uh, that we really need to celebrate. Uh, advocacy in architecture is something we're really dearly lacking. And uh, you know, the regulators have a hard time doing it. The REIC doesn't always have the resources necessary. And so for, for us to have a local chapter that can, can supplement and, and um, speak on our behalf is really valuable. So I, uh, I just want to, I know there's a number of people here that have volunteered many hours uh, for the local chapter and uh, you, you don't get enough thanks. So uh, thank you. For that. So um, when when Sean asked me if I would uh, give this talk, um, he said, "Just just use something you've already done." Uh, and, and oh, sure. I mean, I, I actually do do quite a few talks, and I've been actually been giving a, a talk um, that I call "Designing for Social Impact" uh, for the last couple of years, and had the good fortune to share the story of what we're doing as a firm uh, in various places in the world. And I, I, um, but when I, when I gave the talk at a university in the UK or even at the Festival of Architecture in, in Ottawa, um, of course it's a longer talk, um, but it's a very different audience. And here, you know, I don't think you want to hear about it more. Um, I, I think you, you probably want to hear a little bit more about why and what motivates us and what is actually behind the, the story that we're trying to craft uh, as a firm. So it's a slightly different talk that I normally give. Uh, it's actually quite new. It's just kind of come together over the last uh, little while. So uh, uh, bear with me if it's not as polished as it might, uh, might want it to be. But anyways, with that, I'll start. So really the story I'm, I'm telling tonight is one of uh, transformation. Uh, and a transformation from what, what has been a conventional practice and, 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 and I think the, the sort of traditions of architecture which have grown up really over centuries um, are, are littered uh, and really found on the notion of convention. Uh, and the story that I'm sharing with you today is, is, is how our journey in terms of how we are trying to transform our practice in response to the conditions and, and the things that we think are important for the profession uh, moving forward. So you have a bit of work to do tonight. The first thing is I'd like you to think about somebody that you admire for their courage. Um, think of someone specific. It could be a public figure, a colleague, a mentor, a teacher. Uh, it really doesn't matter. It's somebody that's important to you. And, and ask yourself, what is, it that, what is it that specifically makes you admire their courage? And chances are it's not some aspect of physical bravery. Uh, or perhaps if it is, that's a manifestation of something else that's, that's going on uh, beneath the surface. Chances are what you admire is somebody who's willing to take a stand. Somebody who's willing to stand on their values, take risks, and face the consequences of those, those risks because of their deep conviction to their, to their values. It takes courage to put your values first, and particularly in a professional sense. When you're, when you're practicing and you have so many others' uh, needs and objectives that you have to hold in your hands, when you lead with your values, you are taking a chance, and you are demonstrating courage, and you're needing to, to um, uh, embody that in, in, the, in the way you work. And, and I think that uh, we are a courageous profession, but I think we could be more courageous, and I think it's time for us to regain our courage in many areas where we've become a little bit timid. So, also, there's more audience participation, but not a lot. <laughs> So the next thing I'd like you to ask, um, I'd like to ask you is really a, a show of hands. Um, are you optimistic about the profession of architecture? Could you raise your hand if you are? Amazing. Um, almost, almost everyone, and maybe that's because of the people that are in the room. Um, but it's interesting because every time I ask that question, just about everybody puts up their hands. And, and I recently gave this talk, and I asked that question, and somebody sort of put up their hand and said, you know what, I don't buy that. I don't believe that everybody's as optimistic. I think we're afraid to admit that we're not as optimistic as we are. 
Because when you get a group of architects together, and it may have been very similar this evening when we started this, all you hear about is all the complaints, all the things, with our neighbors that are feet cutting, all of the, the, the parts of our roles that are being usurped by others, all the, we're so quick to complain. And uh, what it tells me is, while we may be optimistic, there's certainly some fear or some frustration or some anxiety that's deeply embedded within, uh, within, within the profession. And so, for me, that anxiety leads to a question, and, and it's a question about whether or not um, the practice of architecture is broken. Um, and there's, I have to admit, at times I do feel that the, the profession is broken, and if, if not broken, perhaps not well aligned for the future, or for uh, what society needs from us in, in the future. Now, I certainly don't, I'm not, uh, I, I don't think we're doomed. In fact, I'm very optimistic um, about uh, the value and the role that we can play. But I do think that we need to change. Uh, and I do think that, that that change is going to require some courage. So to illustrate this, uh, I'm going to share with you a bit of a, a story. Uh, and first of all, I'm going, to, I'm going to guess that everyone here tonight is wearing shoes. Is that anybody not wearing shoes? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, if you know the name of the person who designed your shoes, could you put up your hand? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so the story is about the shoes on the left-hand side of the slide. And the shoes actually are, well, they're boots. The boots belong to my daughter. And when my daughter graduated from high school, uh, we had a pair of boots made for her, and they're made by a wonderful cobbler from Vancouver named Renee McDonald. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. We, we wanted to set her off out into the world on her journeys with something that would be with her, something that we, she would literally be walking her journey with. And the other part of the story that was meaningful for us was the fact that my grandfather was a shoemaker. And the gentleman on, on the left is a self-portrait that my grandfather took in southern Saskatchewan in the 1920s. Um, and uh, I often wonder, you know, if he got together with a group of his colleagues celebrating advocacy for shoemakers, what they would have complained about. If it would have been the price of leather or the fact that uh, somebody didn't value the, the unique skill and attributes that they were bringing to, to, to their work. But all that time, they would have been completely oblivious to the fact that within a generation, nobody would know and nobody would care where their shoes came. There was a change taking place that was much greater than what they were able to see, perhaps. And that's part of my fear. Part of my fear is, are we looking deep enough into the future? Are we looking far enough to really understand the types of changes that are needed within our profession, not just to ensure our ongoing relevance, but really to meet the challenges of society? And so what, what we're trying to do is respond to that in, in, in a more meaningful, a meaningful way. And you might think that our profession is immune to, to, to change and that it's silly to contemplate that uh, you know, our roles will be taken by technology. But we're already seeing great technological change within the way services are delivered and the way construction uh, as, as, uh, is happening. There's many that would speculate that within five, ten years, um, we won't be doing construction documents that will simply be handing over a model. Um, and that's a really easy thing to speculate on. And that's within a, you know, a very graspable uh, time horizon. And, and what happens if 40% of our fees go away? You know, what does that mean for the, for, the, for the future of our profession? Are we asking ourselves these types of questions? So the question is, there are probably certain aspects of what we do that are vulnerable and that will become more efficiently done in another way. And so I think the opportunity for us is to focus on those things that aren't vulnerable, and those unique attributes, and the really powerful skills that we bring to our, to our craft, and ask ourselves, what is it uh, that we can do with that? So some other themes that kind of weave into this um, sort of uh, angst that's driving us uh, as a firm uh, is really questioning about some of the things that uh, that we celebrate. 
and that we focus on and that we elevate within our profession. And here we're, we're celebrating some amazing groups and individuals and, and um, I'm in no way trying to diminish that, believe me. Um, but when you look at the types of things that we're, we're celebrating, if you look at the work that are in the, the latest journals and, and all the blogs that we subscribe to, you know, we see the sexy image and we ooh and we ah and we think, wow, that's amazing. We have no idea what's happening at the street. We have no idea what's happening for the users of those buildings. And are we asking ourselves those questions? We're judging excellence from 10,000 feet. And frankly, I think that's a very poor judge of actually how we're impacting uh, people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. And a lot of, the, a lot of those projects are, are being designed and constructed on the backs of some of the work that we celebrate the most is being designed and completed on the backs of unpaid labor or highly overworked labor. This is not something we should be celebrating within, within our profession. And the work is often completely isolated from the broader context. And I don't mean the physical context, I mean the broader social context of our time. Issues of inequality, injustice, social isolation, global issues, big issues. Are we paying enough attention to those, those types of factors? So the question I have is that as architects, are we, are we doing enough? Are we doing enough in our endeavors to impact the type of change that we need to see happen in our society? Put another way, are we doing enough to actually impact the change that we're capable of having within society? I think they're two different questions. And, and um, because everything we do, all of our design decisions, whether it be a building or a public space or, or a detail, has an impact. It, we're creating the spaces, we're creating the stage for the theater of life. And um, I think we lose sight of that um, too often. I think there's another theme um, within this sort of um, area of concern is there's an interesting debate going on in, in the world of architecture right now, as I see it, uh, between um, uh, those that would espouse uh, that we really focus solely on form um, and those that are looking for a much deeper um, set of values within our work. And, and not to pick on uh, Zaha Hadid Architects, um, but Patrick Schumacher, who is the, now the leader of that firm, it makes it so easy, um, I simply can't resist. Um, and I think there's this, been this interesting debate between Patrick Schumacher uh, and, and those that believe what he believes, and those that would support the values of somebody like Shagir Obama, uh, around really what we should be celebrating uh, in architecture. So a, a year ago, um, almost a year ago, it was in November of last year, Patrick Schumacher delivered a keynote address at the World Architecture Festival in Berlin, and I happened to be, uh, to be present at it. Um, and in it, he presented a manifesto for the future of the profession, uh, much like, in some ways, I'm doing tonight. Much bigger crowd, um, but this is a better crowd. Um, but in his manifesto, he called for the end of nearly any consideration of public interest in architecture. He called for the elimination of social housing, the privatization of parks, uh, and on and on and on. It was a, his belief is based on a, 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 a is founded on a belief that the market will solve all of our woes, and if only we'd get out of the way, and that there's no role for government in in defining a social realm, and there's certainly no role for architects to play in that area as well. And it was. Um, Frankly, it was outrageous. Um, the, 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 the crowd in, in the, uh, the room was really angry. It was quite a spectacle to see, to see the reaction to this, to this message that he was, he was delivering. Um, it was also fascinating to see his firm distance themselves from his philosophy, and the estate of Zaha Hadid distancing themselves from his philosophy, and to see the public um, demonstrate in front of the, their offices. Uh, fascinating, not something we, we tend to see every day in the world of architecture. But, but for me, there was optimism in this because in the room, in, in the reaction to the room, I think a choice was being made. And, and I think there was, it, for me, it's a turning point. It's, it's a point that I personally will look back to, and I think many will look back to, and said, no, that's the end of an era. That's something we reject. We're capable of, and in fact, for much of our history, 
And many of the people in this room have been deeply embedded within a much more socially interested uh, way of work and way of practicing than what we've seen over the last generation of, of architects. And frankly, it's, it's, time, it's time to restake and reassert ourselves within that very important territory. And so one of the reasons for that is that at its very core, uh, architecture is a social art. Um, and it has been from the very beginning. And it's my view that, that the first architectural act was the decision that somebody made to take some stones, roll them together, and create a hearth, and create a fire. And the fire was for protection, it was for security, but it was also to share the story of the hunt, or to, to, to um, it was for socialization. It's where society began. Society began in that, in that constructed place where people came together for mutual support. I think that the, the sort of zenith of public space is probably best represented by the Italian Renaissance and the, and the squares that um, came to represent all aspects of, of civic life, whether it be you know, war, demonstrations, marriages, celebrations, commerce, whatever, whatever needed to happen, happened in these, these spaces. And they were truly democratic, or at least accessible and available to all, at least in their ideal state. But commerce has kind of taken, taken over the notion of, of public space. And I think we've been way too willing over the last number of years to accept pseudo-public space in the form of, of, of private, private space really masquerading as public space as, as our public space and best represented I think as, as the contemporary shopping mall um, which certainly have aspects of publicness until you don't fit the boundaries of what they deem to be acceptable behavior. The moment you cross that line you're no longer welcome uh, which is, of course uh, is not what we need. We, need. we need spaces, we need cities that, that truly accept all, uh, at all members of our, of, our, of our community. So there's another reason where I think the sort of abandonment of, of um, interest in social purpose and architecture came about. And, and again, using maybe overly simplistic representations, I think that um, the, the mistakes we made as a profession in, in the aftermath of the Second World War again, exemplified by some really horrendous public housing projects uh, in which, as a profession, we made some really astonishing claims about what they would do for society. And of course, we know the result of that. They, they, were, they were complete failures. And I believe, um, and in fact, um, I believe even Patrick Schumacher has said that, you know, in response to our inability to actually do a good job, we should just not do it. Um, I don't think that's very courageous. I don't think that's something, I don't think it's acceptable. I don't think we can shirk a fundamental aspect of who we are and, and what it is that we're capable of, of, of how we're influencing our, our communities. This hasn't stopped. There's still significant portions of our communities that we're building that um, are, are not meeting the standards of, of which we, we, we hold high. So while we may have abandoned the notion of, of, of social objectives in our work, it is time to take them back. It, it truly is time to, to re-embrace and reassert ourselves within that sphere of influence within our, with our communities. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's risk involved when you, when you lead with your values. Um, and, you know, there's many risks, and the ones that might be more obvious, the things you might most come to mind is, you know, you're risking your client's money, you're risking um, the profits of your firm, you're doing all, you know, there's sort of the most tangible risks. But frankly, the greater risk is, is the risk of failure. It's the risk of not having the impact that we can have. And the um, leaving a legacy that uh, is, is in fact having a negative uh, impact in our, in our communities. So leading with values, in my mind, is, is the risk uh, is the price of leadership. It's something we have to embrace. It's something that that uh, comes with being leaders within within our communities. Uh, we all take on risk. All all of, all of, all of us in this room at, at various times with our lives um, put ourselves into into positions of that, and and, and we need to be comfortable in that zone. And I know many of the people here are. 
Um, but all of us, all of us need to. It's part, of, frankly, it's part of what um, drew me to to serving on the AIBC Council. Uh, and and you know, it, it's interesting to reflect on that because the work I did with the AIBC Council is some of the most satisfying work I've done in in any of my professional endeavors. Um, and yet, it's probably some of the most challenging as well. Um, and there was risk. Uh, it's also what draws me to teach, and uh, you know, I'm so fortunate to have the opportunity to teach at UBC, and um, you know, to have a hand in being able to shape the next generation of architects is really the most tangible, the most direct way that we can we can influence uh, the future. So I, I talked a little bit earlier about the need for us to focus on our unique uh, set of skills, um, and why I think that is important is. Um, because of this diagram, in, in, a, in well, the diagram reflects the reason why. T society's most pressing problems today, whether it be climate change, social isolation, global inequity, whatever it may be, these are these are what are referred to as wicked problems. And Riddle and Weber, about four years ago, described wicked problems in this way: as having lots of moving parts, radically different perspectives and frames and an intricate series of trade-offs. And the, the types of problems that are constantly changing and, and evolving, and so that by the time you go to solve them, by the time you get there with your solution, they've moved, and it's a different problem. And that's precisely what we do. When we're coordinating all the various uh, aspects of a building project, mutually exclusive variables, we're reconciling, we're finding a way forward. We're not paralyzed by the challenges and by the things that don't fit together. Our Unique skill is to be able to take these circumstances and find a path forward. That skill set, which we've applied so brilliantly to the physical world and to building projects for generations, is imminently applicable to many other challenges that are facing our, our society. And it, it's it really is time for us to assert ourselves in in that in that area in a much much greater way. So what are what are some of the other reasons we might consider um, designing for social impact? Well, one of them, frankly, is in response to the Green Building uh, Movement, which we've all been part of um, uh, over, the, over the past 20 years. And, and while there's much to celebrate uh, in what we've achieved and what we're achieving in, in the Green Building Movement, in many ways, uh, it's failing us as well. Uh, and we don't often acknowledge that failure. We're really reluctant to be critical uh, about the things that we're not achieving within a contemporary green building uh, movement. Uh, we're not getting enough results. We're not getting deep enough. We're not creating enough impact quick enough. Uh, and there's great concern that, that we won't. Um, and again, a way to describe this, using our favorite three-legged stool of economic, social, and environmental uh, sustainability, challenges is that really over the last 20 to 25 years it's looked more like this yeah. we focus so heavily and we've made really good progress in the environmental sphere and we certainly need to continue to do so don't get me wrong um, but we don't have balance and we're not creating the social conditions that need to underpin the environmental positions and andrew ross wrote a really ironic book about sustainability focused on the city of phoenix and I love the book because if ever there was a city that you wouldn't write a book about sustainability, it's Phoenix. Um, but any, anyways, within the book, he, um, he, there's a wonderful quote. And I think he really gets it. He says that you know, the, our approach to averting dramatic climate change is a vast social experiment in decision making and democratic action. And I think that is so true. And it's something we forget. We're behaving as if the systems we're utilizing are proven, that we know that the outcome is certain. Uh, and yet it is an experiment, and it is a social experiment. He also um, goes on to acknowledge that, well, technological advancement is going to be a fundamental part of solving our challenges. Just as decisive, and perhaps more important, will be whether or not the social factors allow for the type of changes that are necessary. Uh, and right now, while we're focusing on technology, we're not focusing necessarily on the social structure that is going to enable the type of change that, uh, that, is, that is required. He, he describes the climate crisis as much social as biophysical. And of course, plants don't use um, energy. 
people do. We do. We're biology. We're, we're not, um, or at least we're social. We're, it's a social problem. We have to change the way we live. We need to, we need to adjust our society to a much more fundamentally sustainable way. And, and also importantly, that the, ultimately the solution to, from a um, sustainability standpoint, we need to be, look much more broadly beyond our borders and, and, and engage in a conversation of what does it mean to be sustainable when you've got literally billions of people uh, around the world that uh, you know, have so little and we have so much. And are, are we willing to really change uh, to create greater global um, balance and, 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 uh, and justice. And, and if we're not, what does that mean? Is that, is that truly something sustainable? So I recently came across this explanation as well. It's a little bit hard to understand. Uh, Kate Raworth, uh, in her Donut Economics Theory, um, I really think describes the situation well. She, she describes a safe and just space for humanity, and that's the, the sort of blue zone in the middle of the diagram. And for that to exist, it needs to be um, sheltered both by an ecological ceiling, which we're, we're, we're getting better at, but it needs to be created on a very strong social foundation. And, and if we don't have the social foundation that balances and creates that synergy with the ecological ceiling, um, it's not going to work. And, and I think it really describes well uh, the challenge of our time, and one of the reasons why we believe that we need to put as much effort as a sector into the social aspects of our work as we are into the environmental aspects. So, one question we ask ourselves from time to time is, are we alone in this, in this journey? And certainly not. Uh, I mentioned Shigeru Ban. Um, there's many, many people doing wonderful work in the area uh, of uh, social impact. Um, Aravena and uh, you know his um, curating of the Venice Biennale is an example that um, you know that shift is happening. I, I I truly believe we're in the midst of a seismic shift in the focus of, of the profession. Others, Jan Gale, others, urban planners, urban planners are way ahead of us uh, in in this in this area. Um, I have got a few criticisms of urban planners as well, but I'll leave those for another, another talk. But I think the realm of landscape design and urban planners are much quicker to assert um, their influence on, on the factors of, of, of socialization than we are as architects. And, and I think we need, to, we need to join the conversation. We need to stand side by side with our colleagues. And uh, we're also inspired by people like uh, the Mass Design Group. Um, you know, not-for-profit architectural firm that's doing amazing work in all around the world, both producing beautiful pieces of architecture, but also creating impact through their work that leaves a legacy, that creates economies, that creates skills within the community. It goes on and on and on. It's a very, they're applying a very comprehensive set of values and, and um, expectations of success to their work. Um, so there's many, there are others doing this, um, but I don't think there's enough. And, and I think that we, we need, much like we had 25 years ago in the start of the green building movement, we need a collective effort to be able to uh, bring the entire industry uh, along this, this path. So I'm going to describe how we're <coughs> responding to this challenge. And by no means uh, is this the only way forward or the best way forward, but it's ours. Um, and so that's the only one I can share. Um, so how, what are, the, what are the things that we're doing to um, have greater social impact in our work? Well, the first is, is, is by committing to it, by asserting it, by standing up and saying this is something that's important to us in our work, and by sharing the story, and by living it and breathing it uh, in, in, our, in our projects uh, and, and, in, um, and, and within the firm. The second... Uh, is to try to find ways to measure it. Uh, and this is where it gets really challenging. Um, because how do you measure happiness? How do you measure joy? How do you measure connectedness in a community? Um, these are things that as architects, we're not very skilled at understanding, uh, let alone measuring. We can't hook up a meter to it and get a, a reading. Um, now, Fortunately, others are. Um, if, we, if we look to our colleagues in the social sciences, 
there are um, ways of understanding community connectedness, community capacity. Um, the challenge, however, is that they're highly complex frameworks and they're not very applicable in day-to-day -day practice. So what does that mean? Well, we've done some research. Uh, research is a really important part of what we're doing as a firm, um, embedded across, across the firm. Um, we came across this framework for social sustainability assessment out of the UK, Professor Tim Dixon. Interestingly enough, this analysis, and, and frankly, if you're interested in the subject, the UK is where we're seeing the most interesting research. And interestingly enough, a lot of it's coming from the private sector. It's, it's coming from the, um, the private sector uh, housing developers who are seeing a return and seeing a value in having greater social out outcomes in their, in their projects, which is, which is wonderful. Anyways, that's a bit of an aside. This diagram um, from the UK is actually in response to an analysis of the uh, community plan that was put together for Vancouver Southeast Falls Creek uh, many years ago. And so it's fascinating to come across this little piece of research that was taking the sort of the energy and what was happening here in the city of Vancouver, putting it through this academic lens and producing this really quite interesting graphic. Um, but it's the best one we found that uh, is a way of describing the problem that we have in, in evaluating and uh, framing a conversation about social impact. So it, it, what it does is it links a series of principles or objectives with a series of themes. And what you see very quickly is you get all these different types of interconnections and uh, an incredible complexity. Um, however, within that, for us, we found a way to embed those ideas in something that we could apply to our practice. And so we generated uh, what we call our social impact framework. You know, we borrowed the, the principles of equity, inclusion, security, and adaptability from Professor Dixon. Um, and we used that as a, as a way of starting the conversation about setting values and goals and objectives for, for, our, for our projects. Above, the principles are, are the processes. Um, so we're looking at how it is that we work both internally and with the community and after a project is complete. Um, and what are the possible impacts of, of that work? So we're redesigning our processes um, to have greater impact. And we're extending and we're recognizing that the project life cycle actually starts well before there's an RFP and it ends way after you know, we sign the last certificate and then, and then look away and, and hope it all worked out. And of course we know it did. Um, then ultimately there's the design strategies on top of that because there's also things we can do with our designs that have greater or worse impact. And we need to better understand them and we need to in, uh, research them, we need to share best practices. Um, so, as I mentioned, we created this for our own use, just as a way of starting down a path of trying to understand how to better have a conversation about social, what we were calling social sustainability at the time, which I actually don't like that term when I use social impact now, but, and for us it's been really helpful because it has given us a way of having a conversation, it's given us a way of focusing our research, it's given us a way of, of um, adding processes and structures that allow us to better understand the challenge that we've committed to. So the third way that we're taking on this challenge is by transforming our practice. Uh, I mentioned that the talk I've been giving is, is called Designing for Social Impact, but, but really what the talk is is how we're redesigning our firm for maximum social impact. Um, it's not about what we're doing with the project, it's about how it is that we're, we're different and we're behaving differently mm -hmm. and we're structuring ourselves differently to be able to have a different set of outcomes. So one of the things we've done um, is embrace the notion of interdisciplinarity. Uh, we've brought in other design disciplines, um, other um, schools of thought into our practice. Um, we brought in communication design, engagement specialists, a fashion designer, uh, any number of different types of creative thinkers into, into our practice as a way of opening up our minds to different ways of creative thinking. And it's allowed us to bring a different set of, 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 um, of uh, influences uh, to, to our work. And we've also done within the organization itself. We've done how we structure teams. We've done how we, how we communicate and how we position ourselves uh, as well. And, 
again, it's part of this, what I introduced initially, that, that notion that we're moving, we're transforming our practice, we're, we're changing, and we're shifting from a conventional mode to a transformed mode. And in some ways, in some cases, the shifts are very subtle. Uh, in other ways, they're, they're much more significant. But uh, they're all important, and, and they do require um, an attention and, and, a, and a purpose. Um, one of the things we're really excited about is a project we're working on for the city of Surrey at the moment, and it's a new community facility in Clayton Heights area. It's a Clayton Community Hub, uh, where we it's the first project that we've really been able to take this set of values and this set of processes and procedures and really hone them. And uh, some of the results that we're seeing uh, out of the process at this time is, is really quite. A, we started that project with a workshop where we established objectives only on the only on the the um, the social uh, goals for the project. So long before we designed the project, we established a set of goals uh, around the social objectives. And so it was a, a really interesting way to, to start that project. So the fourth way for us is to ask this question, is to ask ourselves what else is possible. And, and what, what's embedded in that is a question uh, recognizing that within you know, the capacity of a mid-sized architectural firm, um, there is bandwidth, there is capability, there is a voice, there is the ability to take a stand and to, to uh, think beyond our projects, think beyond the work we do for our clients and think what can we do on our own for our own uh, uh, benefit or our own uh, learning um, that will enhance who we are as, as, uh, as designers. And we do this in a number of ways, um, but probably the easiest way to describe it, the most obvious uh, version of it is what uh, we're doing with our Tilt Curiosity Labs. And some of you may be aware of, of, of that, but for us, Tilt is, a, is an area, you know, in this diagram, it's kind of the outer reaches. It's, it's the area beyond our practice, the conventional practice, beyond our expanded interdisciplinary practice, and it's a non-client zone. It's an area of investigation and um, exploration where we um, take our knowledge and expertise and project it outward, and where we learn, we bring that knowledge back in and, and uh, influence uh, what, we, what we do. I'm just going to show you a short video um, that describes some of the things that we've been doing with that. So hopefully the sound works. Tilt is our Curiosity Labs. It's the place where we've given ourselves permission to explore and to investigate uh, and to be provocative. Uh, so it's a place where we're, we're asking questions of ourselves and asking questions of the community. IDS West Stage was an example of that because what it did was allow us to uh, play in a sandbox that we normally haven't had the chance to play in before. How does space affect us in the way we move? It's a really interesting question and I think that's you know really at the heart of architecture. The Artist in Residence program creates an environment of collaboration. This lets us ask questions that reshapes how we see the world today. What stands out from her experience here um, is just how disruptive and inspiring something as different as what she did. It was one of those aha moments where we said exactly, that's exactly why we're doing this, that's exactly why we are investing our energy and our time in, in having these types of conversations. We're a firm full of very creative people and the energy that comes from putting it all together like this is really quite phenomenal. One of this room is stoked to have an amazing day at Tilt City. Tilt City is really about looking at particular parts of the city. What else could this be? What else could exist here? We could get people to believe that something temporary and ephemeral could even have a permanent impact. The problems that we deal with are highly complex and, and involve a whole array of, of human emotions and conditions and, and systems. Traditionally, we've applied overly simplistic ways of understanding and influencing those. So this is a way of trying to break down those overly simplistic ways of looking at problems and understand them from a much broader range of perspectives. It's really about bringing a broader array of thinking and expertise into our work so at our core we can, do, uh, we can improve the services that we're offering to our clients uh, and make a, a bigger difference in, in our community. The world is full of good ideas, but crucial to maximizing our social impact is really understanding the world that is. Then we can collectively dream about a world that could be, frame those ideas and move them forward. That is Tilt. Uh, 
Um, one of the projects in there was the work we did with the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association, which is the uh, transformation of uh, the laneway between uh, just off of uh, Hastings at Granville that we call Alley Loop. Um, and it's a fascinating uh, example for us of what you can do with a, with a very small budget and, and some really creative thinking. Um, and um, while we don't believe that every alleyway in Vancouver should be painted pink, um, we do think that there's tremendous potential in underutilized spaces and that what we really need is a conversation about about what's possible in these in these in these public spaces, and I think one of the one of the greatest impacts beyond uh, all of the statistics and data I can give you on how the how the usage has changed and how and how the gender balances has balanced in in the laneway uh, and how people stay there longer. Um, I think what's really important is that the door's been opened and the conversation has been started, and now we're starting to see. Uh, examples of, of this show up all over the city and I, and I think once it starts we're going to see what happened in places like Sydney or Melbourne where where the laneways are now some of the most um, sought after spaces within the entire city and we're, we're, we're so ready for that and uh, so uh, this this was um, a, uh, a really important and our, and our latest one uh, our next one is actually under construction right now next to the Orpheum Theatre um, and I encourage you to pay attention to that one as well. It's the same spirit that, that infuses our, of course, we are architects at our core, and, and that's not going to change. Um, but it's the same spirit of innovation and questioning that infuses things like a question that asks whether or not it's possible to spend 60 meters with something that's 250 millimeters deep. Um, so, you know, the scale may be very, very different. Um, but um, the process and, and the inquiry and the inquisitiveness is, is, is the same. And it's really what we're bringing to our, our, recent pro our, our upcoming project in, in Clayton as well, where we're, we're really pushing ourselves to own up to these objectives and to be able to both measure and, uh, um, and report out on, on, their, on their success. So there, there's been many lessons along the way for us. Um, and uh, some of them are, are straightforward. Um, but um, what's, what's most important is, is that idea is that we just see, have to ask different questions. We have to, no question is crazy. Um, and that we, we need to find a way to um, assert ourselves in areas of, of community interest where architects have tended not to stick their noses. There's also been some failure uh, along the way. Uh, not everything's gone perfectly, not everything's gone well, um, and that's good. Um, we've embraced failure as a necessary part of, of getting better. In fact, we've given ourselves permission to fail, which as an architect is a really challenging thing to do. Um, you know, we're conditioned by code and by statute and by all the things we need to be accountable for as professionals to avoid failure at all costs. Uh, but it's actually on that edge of failure where uh, creativity uh, maximizes uh, its impact. And so we've, we've said that these things we're doing, not all of them are going to be successful, not all of them are going to work, and, and that's, that's just fine. Um, and we're going to be willing to pull back and try something else. And, and, so, and we've, got, we've got examples that, uh, that, that didn't work uh, as well along the way. So again, I'm nearing the end. Um, it, uh, as I mentioned, we, we're, we're, it's a social art, and um, what's really critical for us is, is not just uh, the physical aspects of what we're doing, but it's what we're learning along the way, the processes that we're developing, the relationships that we're building, and the way that we're finding uh, we can learn from the community in a much, uh, much deeper way. And I think it's that, ex that willingness to push ourselves into uncomfortable territory, which is going to be uh, what ensures that our, we're, we're relevant uh, well into the future. Uh, it's that willingness to explore um, and to, to take on different questions and to meet the, the future needs of society uh, that is going to ensure that they continue to value us well in, into the future. Thank you.